Okay, hello everyone. My name is uh, Ofek Shilon. I'm a developer at uh, Istra Research, which is an uh, Israeli-based trading company. I'll be presenting to you today uh, a few tools, but mostly OptView 2, uh, that help you pick the compiler's brain and know about optimizations it might have missed and what you might be able to do about them. Now, sure. We're all probably um, vaguely aware or we've heard some uh, statements uh, in the type of compiler is um, overly pessimistic or the compiler can't prove various stuff and uh, various optimizations are inhibited as a result. But wouldn't it be useful if we had a tool that can shed light on these specific spots? What if the compiler could tell you, I couldn't prove, prove A and as a result, I couldn't optimize B? Turns out that more often than not, uh, there are things we can do about it. The first half of the talk would be dedicated to tools that en enable shedding this light. Uh, the oldest such tool has been around for actually quite a while. It is a, a compiler switch, a switch family, in fact. It is called RPAS. What it does, it activates a sort of internal verbose mode that causes various uh, optimization passes in the compiler to emit their internal logs to STD out for us to inspect. And here's what it looks like. Now, this is the type of display that makes my eyes glaze over. It's a wall of text uh, with no structure, with no grouping, with no context. Surely we can do better. Now, a minor step towards better uh, was, taken, was taken by a tool called LLVM Opt Report. Uh, this is a tool by Hal Finkel, an LLVM developer. It looks something like that. It is a textual dump of the source with a, what's called optimization remarks encoded, well, actually encrypted is a better word, uh, somewhere uh, in this left column. Uh, which is a step forward. Uh, this encoding mechanism is documented and uh, it can be deciphered, but there, there are, please don't, do, don't use this. There are much better tools today. Here's one, opt viewer. And uh, opt viewer output, output looks like this. This is a significant step forward. This is an HTML of the source, of the C++ source, annotated with optimization remarks. This is the technical term used in the, used in the documentation. These orange lines are, uh, hold this essentially the same info as the RPAS output, but in context and uh, in better layout. Uh, let's talk a bit more about this. This work, uh, this is 2016 work led by Adam Nimit, who's an LLVM developer uh, based in Apple. Uh, I highly recommend uh, you watch this talk. Uh, if you ever cloned LLVM, you already have it. Uh, otherwise, you can download it via a dev package. And let's talk a bit about the basic usage. First, you build your source as you would with an added compiler switch, F save optimization record. When you do, opt YAML files are generated by default alongside your obj files. Here's a snippet from such an uh, opt YAML file. It's essentially a bunch of strings saying approximately what happened and where. Uh, clearly this is for consumption by um, software, not by humans. And this consumption, this processing into the HTMLs I've shown, happens through a Python script. You run the script optViewerPy. This is the heart of the optViewer tool. You tell it 
uh, where to generate the HTMLs, where to take the sources from, and where to take the YAMLs from. And uh, these two stages result in HTMLs of the form I presented. Now, I said OptViewer contains essentially the same info as an RPAS output. I want to discuss, to dedicate a, a bit of time to discuss the added benefits. First, these numbers on the left, these are hotness numbers. If by chance you're able to build your project with PGO, with profile guided optimization, you have profile data on some reference uh, run script. And uh, OptViewer is smart enough to uh, draw this data and incorporate it into this display, thereby hopefully helping you decide where to focus your attention, which lines are important to optimize and which aren't. The second useful bit on info, of info is this right column. This is inlining context. Uh, any function can and typically does undergo inlining into various different colors. In each such inlining context, different optimization decisions can be taken. So each such individual optimization remark is emitted in the context of a specific inlining context. And here for the first time, you're able to see directly this inlining context. Last but not least, this half line. Load of type I32 not eliminated in favor of store uh, was dumped already by RPAS. Because it is clobbered by store is new to OptViewer. I realize both halves of, the, of these lines are pretty opaque uh, still. We will dedicate uh, a lot of time to dive deeply into them. Okay, so I think, I, I truly think this was great work, but if I had to guess, none of you ever heard of it. Has anyone here ever used OptViewer? And it has been around for uh, six years. Um, now, I don't know why, but I can speculate. First, um, this tool is heavy to the point of being unpleasant to work with. Uh, I had to stop runs on medium-sized projects when uh, uh, when they consumed uh, 80 or 90, 90 gigs of RAM. When runs did succeed, uh, they generated HTMLs in sizes that break browsers. Um, it wasn't an easy ride. And even more importantly, uh, it was presented at an LLVM uh, conference, it was designed with compiler authors in mind. Uh, even if I do jump through the right hoops and uh, manage to generate these HTMLs, the vast majority of the content is non-actionable to me. These are internal logs uh, that carry meaning for the specific LLVM developer who coded this pass. Um, so an extra step can be taken to make this info accessible and usable for me and for general developer audience. Uh, this extra step is called OptView2. Uh, this is work by me. I forked the um, Python scripts from the LLVM trunk, started hacking away at them to make them uh, to, to improve the signal to noise ratio and to make them to improve the usability for me personally. Um, a lot of small steps were taken. In a nutshell, um, I collect only optimization failures. I don't care about uh, internal diagnostic info and optimizations that succeeded. I exclude system headers. Uh, I might be excluding some actionable info, but for the most part, uh, I don't. I remove a lot of duplicities. Uh, I enable uh, regex filtering of uh, optimization remark types and passes through a config file um, with some default config file context that are best for me, but you can hack away at them if you want. 
Uh, I was able in this way to reduce the output by two orders of magnitude. It is still a bit noisy, but two orders of magnitude less noisy. I also restored a column info that is a small carrot that tells you where within the line the optimization remark pertains to. It was lost on the transition from R pass to opt viewer. Uh, there's now a command line switch that enables us to split the run into subfolders. This is actually a big deal. This is what makes running on medium and large size projects feasible. Um, there's a large index table of all uh, uh, generated remarks that was completely rewritten from the grounds up, not by me, by uh, my friend Ilan Ben Hagai. There's other stuff that happens, uh, but uh, that's enough to give, a, to give a flavor of it. These are three links to um, public uh, repositories containing outputs of OptView 2 on some uh, public, uh, publicly available sources. Uh, when you click on one, you get to an index table that looks something like this. When you click on any of the locations of the remarks on the left, you see something like this. Okay, uh, now another happy surprise is that these capabilities, not of OptView 2, not of my hacks, but of OptViewer, the official LLVM tool, is mostly available in Godbolt. If you select any Clang compiler, you can add new optimization output. When you do, you get a pane like this. It doesn't have interleaved optimization remarks, but it does have a colorful sidebar. And when you hover above it, you get the optimization remarks not filtered and uh, without link and without interline uh, info, but that is mighty useful. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the large majority of the remaining slides would be screenshots from this pane in Godbolt. Okay, uh, the large part of uh, this presentation uh, would be devoted to individual examples of these optimization remarks, how to interpret them and how to solve them if we so wish. The simplest such example is inlining. The inlining pass can uh, emit uh, a few optimization remarks. Here's one. Uh, Destructor of mat would not be inlined into yada yada because its definition is unavailable. That's an easy one. What, what does that mean? Sorry? Exactly. The header contained a declaration only, as typically headers do. Uh, now, this might be what the developer wanted, but personally, I was surprised. The, uh, the structure of the uh, math class is simple enough to be at least considered for inlining. If I were an OpenCV developer, I would, I would probably use uh, this um, optimization remark as an indicator to move the implementation into the header. Now, even when I do, it is not guaranteed that this implementation would be inlined. Enter this second remark. Function yada yada, not inlined into whatever, because too costly to inline. This cost is some heuristic approximation of the inlining cost. It is compared against some internal threshold. And in this case, uh, this approximation heuristic crossed the threshold and no inlining was done. If uh, some judgment needs to be exercised, if I were to say that I want this function to be inlined, what could I have done? Anyone has an idea? Up the threshold. Up the threshold. At least in uh, uh, Clang and GCC, that's a reasonable option. That's a project-wide change in decisions. What else can be done? Force inline attribute. Force inline attribute. Excellent. These are the two routes I'd suggest to solve such remarks. Now let's go to somewhere more interesting. Clobbered by store. 
Here I have a function with a silly loop. I take a buffer of 10 ints and some increment, loop over the 10 slots of this buffer and add B to each one. Now, if for some weird reason someone would ask me to generate assembly manually for this function, what I would do is uh, put B in a register, iterate over the 10 slots of A, and increment B, use the value in the register of B to increment each one of these slots. This is not what the compiler does. There will be plenty of disassembly in the slides. Don't worry if you're not comfortable with them. You can get a lot of value without it. But in case you're comfortable with assembly, you can see here that uh, what the compiler chose to do is <clears throat> load B into the register EAX, add EAX into A0, load B from, the from memory into the register EAX again, add EAX to A1, load B from memory again, add it to A2, etc. Uh, that's sad. Uh, you might, uh, if you're an experienced uh, C++ developer, you probably already have a good idea what happened, but let's pretend we don't. And let's watch the optimization remark. That's a useful hint. Load of type I32, that's B, not eliminated in favor of load, because it is clobbered by store. Load of B not eliminated. I, the compiler, wanted to eliminate the load of B, the repeated loading of B in, from memory into register, but I couldn't. Why not? Because it is clobbered by store. The only store inside is the store into AI. How can it be that this store clobbers B? There's a name for this phenomena and it was uh, mentioned at least in two talks uh, in this conference alone. Anyone, in, anyone knows the name? Aliasing, Alias thank you. Um, in fact, uh, there was an entire talk de de devoted to aliasing uh, by uh, Roy Barkan. How many people saw this talk? Excellent, that actually saved me some slides. Um, if you haven't seen this talk, uh, then uh, shame on you. It was a marvelous talk, and uh, in general, Roy is a very handsome man and a symbol of everything that is good in the world, and uh, I'm only partly saying that because he's my boss. <laughs> okay, so suppose uh, I want to uh, combat this aliasing. You already know of one method. I can decorate either A or B as a restrict. Restrict means uh, the memory occupied by A is not aliased by any other variable, as, as you can see on the right, the code generated is significantly better. Not only do we not repeatedly load B from memory into register, we can now parallelize the execution of the loop iterations, and this code is vectorized. Note also that the optimization uh, remark on failed optimization is gone. Okay, uh, there might be, sure. Sorry? Right. Uh, aliasing, in a nutshell means, um, suppose uh, B, uh, note that B is uh, passed by reference. Suppose the caller passed as B, A4. In this case, uh, I cannot freeze the value of B at the register at the beginning of the loop and use it in 10 iterations. After the fourth, fifth iteration of the loop, the value of the increment is different. The compiler has no visibility into the caller, and so it cannot rule out such a scenario, and it is forced to load B from memory into a register on every iteration. Thank you. Sure. Uh, does it mean that uh, I think a more user-friendly optimization here is just uh, passing B by value? 
com I, I can't understand you. Uh, does it mean that instead of restrict, a more user-friendly definition here would be to pass B by value? A excellent remark. Yes. This would uh, force, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Uh, if I had passed P by value, would the optimization uh, kick in? The answer is a definite yes. In this example, uh, it would definitely uh, avoid aliasing. Uh, toy examples typically pass around uh, ints or floats or other small data. In real life code, this is not always a feasible option. Uh, this argument can be a multi-megabyte class uh, that you don't want to pass by value. But yes, this is a, a factor to, to consider. Okay, uh, I will go over, over this briefly. Um, strict aliasing is something that was very confusing to me. It is a permission we give the compiler to assume that if two variables have different types, they cannot alias. This can be useful. Maybe we can weaponize it to communicate to the compiler that two types, uh, that two variables cannot alias by fiddling with a type. Here's the same loop, this is the same exact code with the same uh, bad code generated. And here's a small change. I changed int to long. And behold, as optimizations kick in. That's nice. That should be useful uh, elsewhere. Now, to make it more general, uh, we'd need some mechanism by which to generate as many uh, int-like types as we want. Uh, this is called uh, strong type devs. Unfortunately, it is not a part of C++, uh, despite uh, several papers and uh, discussions at the committee. There are, uh, I'm aware of at least five libraries that try to implement this as wrappers to say int in this example. And this should have worked. In practice, your mileage, your mileage may seriously vary. Compilers are struggling. I did submit uh, a few uh, LLVM issues about it. Uh, here's one. You're welcome to click it and join the conversation. I won't go into deeper details here. OK, let's go to an even, even more interesting uh, optimization remark. Clobbered by call. Uh, the phrasing is similar, but the root cause is very different. Here's another snippet of silly code. F accepts an int i, calls some func on i, increments i and calls whatever, increments i and calls whatever, and a third time increments i and calls whatever. Now on first glance on this code, the first thing I would do is I would probably coalesce the three increments of i into a single increment by three. On second look in this code, I would probably eliminate I altogether after the call to some func, it is seem entirely unused. Again, this is not what the compiler does. In the code on the, on the right, you can relatively easily see that not only is, y, is I not eliminated, it is in fact incremented three separate times before each call to whatever. And again, let's go for clues to the optimization remark. When I hover in Godbolt, I see load of type I32 not eliminated in favor of store because it is clobbered by call. That's a rather different phenomenon. The call in question is the call into some func. Some func, again, accepts int by reference which means that the address of i is visible inside some func, inside, uh, in a compiler uh, author's terminology. This, is, uh, this means the address of i escapes 
through, th through some funk. Once it does, crazy things can happen. Some funk can store the address of I in some globally accessible location. Uh, even worse, whatever can check the contents of this uh, location. Whatever's return value might depend on the value of I. Uh, this code uh, doesn't make sense, but, but we're in compiler land. The, the common sense has no power here. The compiler cannot rule out these crazy scenarios. And so the compiler is forced to, incre to keep I alive and keep incrementing it. Now, uh, I can suggest quite a few things to counter that. First, I can decorate some, f sorry, before the first. Uh, again, if I would have passed int by value, none of this would have happened. Now, back on track. Uh, if I decorate some funk with attribute pure, I communicate the, to the compiler that some funk does not modify global state. The first link in the chain of the events that the compiler was afraid of does not happen. As you can see, uh, the generated code is much nicer. However, that is slightly cheating because if the function some funk does not modify global state and returns void, it does nothing. And the call to it can be eliminated altogether. The compiler, the compiler can make that reasoning and uh, some funk call is eliminated. As an anecdote, if it returns non-void, uh, the attribute pure should have worked, but in Clang it doesn't. In GCC it does. There's an, there's an interesting discussion about it at this link. I won't go further here. Next, another thing I can do is decorate whatever with attribute const. Const is a more restrictive attribute than pure. It means not only does whatever not modify global state, it does not even read it. So even if I's address escaped through some func, and even if I's address is stored somewhere accessible globally, whatever does not access it. Again, optimizations do kick in. Uh, you, it's enough to see that this code is significantly shorter than the original. Um, on closer inspection, please note that uh, with this decoration, whatever is called only once, and the results are copied from EAX. This is, this is the register that holds the return value. Uh, and the return value is copied individually to each one of the three res slots. And the compiler can reason that if whatever is called without arguments and without access to global state, the three calls must emit the same return value and there's no point in calling it three times. Um, now, the best option that I can suggest, the one that probably best captures my semantic intentions in this story example, is another little known uh, attribute. This is called attribute no escape. This decorates an argument, not a function, and it does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it says that this argument's address does not escape in this call. Optimizations do kick in, I is not incremented and not used anywhere, not retained after the call to some func. Now, uh, as a side note, um, attributes pure and const are available uh, in other compilers, partially, more on that uh, later on. Attribute no escape, as far as I can tell, is Clang only at this point. Here's another nice tidbit. Turns out that if I even accidentally type a plus here, optimizations kick in. No increments of I can be visible. I was uh, somewhat surprised and mildly entertained by this when a colleague showed me this. Can anyone uh, say why? Exactly. It seems like the semantics are unchanged, but they are. 
uh, plus i is a temp object. Even if its address escapes through the call to some func, this is no longer uh, the address of i. And the last thing I want to say about this remark is that sometimes the offending code is not your own. Uh, in this example, pointer escape does happen through a call to OFStream's operator left left. Uh, I had some success with using wrappers. Uh, sometimes I can wrap this uh, operator with, uh, uh, with my own implementation and decorate it whatever I want, however I, I want. Sometimes the compiler can use these added attributes to optimize, sometimes not. I don't dare say anything categorically about this. Sure. In your, on the previous slide, the first call and the call to whatever, some from whatever were inlined Presumably, the compiler could turn back on the optimization so it's got more information about what's actually happening. Uh, it does, uh, let me uh, check if I understood the question. Uh, you're commenting that if some funk was inlined, the compiler could reason about its implementation and avoid the escape. Uh, you, the compiler doesn't have, doesn't even have to inline it uh, if it had the uh, implementation visible. At this point, it might have been able to reason about it. That's true. Not always. I, I, I'm often surprised at um, such analysis results. I, I'm also unpleasantly surprised by um, LTO's impact on this. Um, I prefer to discuss this later. If I don't, please remind me at the end, okay? I, I'll need a bit more context for this. Uh, and thank you for the question. Okay. <clears throat> Another very, very common optimization remark that you see when, uh, when uh, exploring your code with OptView2 is this one. Failed to move load with loop invariant address. This is actually the first time I'm showing C++ code. Uh, no, that's not true, I had references. Uh, anyway, this is the first time uh, I'm showing classes, and I have a class with a single member and a single method, and this method runs a loop of five iterations, checks cond, and if it is true, calls f. Now, a very natural looking optimization would be to hoist mcond out of the loop and uh, load it to a register and test its value once instead of five times. And the compiler via optimization remark now can tell you that it really wanted to do this, but it failed miserably to move load with loop invariant address, the only loop invariant address inside is mcond. And why? Because the loop may invalidate its value. The loop body, which is a call to f, f uh, is, does not take arguments as is not even a class method, may invalidate the value of mcond. How can that be? Global state again, thank you. Once within classes, the battle, the battle against uh, escape is a lost battle. The, this pointer is accessible in all class methods, and even worse, the, uh, this pointer of a particular instance can be stored anywhere in, uh, in the program. We have no visibility into F, and we cannot, we the compiler cannot rule out the possibility that it has access to this and can do whatever it wants with it. Uh, so we already seen some techniques that might counter this. If I would have um, marked F as uh, pure, uh, it would have been enough. But 
I, I want to uh, take this chance to add another uh, way to your arsenal, and that is to say, if the compiler can't hoist mcond out of the loop, maybe I can. I can. When I do, a generated code, uh, sorry, the optimization remark vanishes, and the generated code is what I would have expected. I check cond once and call f five times. Uh, uh, now, let it be said, uh, this is not good C++ code. Um, it, it, it's actually kind of embarrassing to advocate for such code at a C++ conference, but uh, I, I hope to see the day where we don't have to resort to such hacks, but that day is still not here. Please, please don't run around hoisting members, uh, putting members in locals throughout your code to take them out of loops. Uh, do this when you have a very concrete reason to, when you can see measurable results as a result of this change. Okay, this is a short summary for reference uh, of the four optimization remarks that I showed. You're very welcome um, to print this on poster size sheet and hang this over your bed, or maybe that's just me. And let's extend the discussion a bit uh, beyond Clang. Uh, so sometimes in 2018, a GCC uh, attempt to uh, do similar work uh, was started. A GCC developer named David Malcolm, working from Red Hat, uh, saw Adam Nimitz's work and was rightfully impressed and started an effort to do the same for GCC. Um, GCC, uh, as of now, accepts a similar, uh, an identical compiler switch, F-save optimization record. Um, it, it works a bit differently. It doesn't generate YAML files, it generates JSON files which is actually a better choice, and it's processed differently and emits different remarks, um, uh, but it's there. The scripts that process the raw info into HTMLs did not make it into the GCC trunk. They're available in David Malcolm's uh, personal repository. Here's a snippet of one such output from a GCC version of OptViewer. Um, and I won't go into details about it because I couldn't really get it to work. It's active, uh, it's inactive since 2018, um, and it's still very much at prototype quality, even when you do manage to get um, JSON files out of a compilation, the Python script that process them often break, I fixed one bug in my fork and reported another, but um, uh, it's still not production ready. I very, very much hope that this work can still be revived. I think it could be mighty useful, um, but it's not there yet. Okay, the vocabulary across compilers is, uh, has some variance. Uh, Clang has restrict, pure, constant, no escape. GCC does not have escape. ICC, the Intel compiler, does not have pure and no escape. Uh, the same goes for MSVC, and the terminology and semantics are slightly different. I won't go into details. If you're working on MSVC and uh, wish to enjoy this work, please read the, docu the documentation. Um, now, uh, none of the other compilers, it turns out, as far as I know, have similar uh, inspection tools, have anything similar to OptView 2. But in my experience, uh, the results of invest, if you're able to compile your code, even code snippets with Clang, the results of investigation with OptView or OptView 2 pertain to other compilers. Compilers tend to struggle at very different locations. 
alias analysis is hard, escape analysis is hard, we probably uh, will never have fully automated solutions and uh, we will always uh, search for ways to communicate knowledge in these niches to the compiler, to any compiler. Okay, um, the last thing I want to discuss, uh, a natural question arises when uh, I present this. Sure. Uh, how would you use the decorators cross-platform? The question was, how would I use the decorators uh, across platform? Uh, I would add an, uh, pl a platform uh, dependent macro. There's actually, uh, there's actually a publicly available one, uh, but I forgot its name. Headley. Sorry? Headley. Headley, thank you. I would probably use Headley. Headley is a compiler agnostic wrapper. It's a single header uh, that wraps these attributes and many others. Thank you very much, sir. Yes? Uh, that's a good remark, thank you. Uh, Jason remarked that uh, I can also use the C++ uh, syntax for attributes, which is uh, uh, double brackets, double square brackets, starting and ending. Okay. Um, it is very natural to ask whether this extra effort is justified. Um, and the short answer is I don't know in your particular context and I don't have anything uh, uh, definite or absolute to say. I can share some data, data points. First, my own experience uh, recently um, I used similar, I, I used these tools and similar trickery to attack some uh, bottleneck uh, at work. Uh, and, and it is a known bottleneck and it is a function that already received some optimization love. And nevertheless, we were able to measurably optimize it. Um, a second data point is a marvelous article called the uh, Petosra, Petops, optimistic Static Program Annotations by Dorfert, Homerding, and Finkel, by leading uh, LLVM uh, researchers. Um, they did something rather ambitious. They identified 14 junctions where the compiler typically takes pessimic, overly pessimistic decisions. Um, and they made a version of the compiler that tries to be optimistic. Uh, if you uh, switch all optimistic switches to on, you typically break the semantics of your code. So they devised some um, search mechanism through the parameter space that tries uh, as many uh, optimistic switches as it can without breaking uh, some reference test run. Uh, these 14 switches are not C++ attributes. These are LLVM IR decorations. Most of them are not accessible through C++. Some of them are. Uh, we've introduced uh, two, uh, more than two, but aliasing and escape are two. There are 12 more there. And when they did, they saw a very significant speed up. This is fascinating work, beautifully done. I really recommend reading it. So this is sort of a hypothetical ceiling to the attainable speed up through um, through this type of this type of effort. And a final data point is another research: uh, optimistic responses to alias queries, presented by Huckelheim and. And Dorfert, I do hope very much I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, this, was, this work was more narrowly focused. They focused only on alias queries. There are many of these in uh, the LLVM uh, passes already, but they added a new one. They added a new alias pass, 
Elias analysis pass that says if, as is typically the case, uh, all of the alias uh, analysis passes before me couldn't determine with a, whether this particular pair of pointers alias, let's assume that they don't. Um, now, that, that's a very solid methodology to try to understand um, whether this thread of inquiry has any value or not. And they concluded it doesn't. I briefly corresponded with uh, Huckelheim, and he describes these results as uh, sobering. So I can't say anything with certainty. The closest thing I have to a recommendation is don't waste your time uh, randomly selecting uh, optimization remarks to try to solve. Cons uh, profile, understand your bottlenecks. When you do, this can be uh, an important new tool to try to uh, solve bo known bottlenecks. And if either you're working at the sub millisecond scale or you're working on very tight loops, loops with small body and a very large number of iterations, the risk that you're wasting your time is small there's a good chance you'd get measurable results from these uh, type of tools. Okay, so the bottom line is, um, uh, let's take a high level view of this. Uh, we, typically, we typically don't um, converse with our compiler. It's more of a monologue. We, we, throw, we throw our code at it and uh, run away screaming and to hide somewhere and hope for the best. This doesn't have to be this way. This could be some first step into something that looks more like a dialogue. The compiler can talk to you. It can ask you questions about uh, your code. With the right tools, you can hear it, and sometimes you can answer. Not always. Thank you very much. That's all I had to say. I would, uh, very be, I would be very happy for you to give this tool a try, and I would be very happy to try and answer questions, if you have any. <laughs>